Hello, welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 22, the second to last episode of Season 2. We are we are there, Melissa. When we're done talking about this episode, we will be on to the final episode of Season 2. I can't two. wait. We have to talk about it now. Forget and we, it. And we accidentally watched yeah, the opening. We, you accidentally the, watched the opening <laughs> for the finale. <laughs> and then I like to think of like, oh, this is such a better episode. Why can't we watch that one? <laughs> this episode... Trust Fund Pirates, sorry, Season 2, Episode 22, titled Trust Fund Pirates, originally premiered on May 2nd, 1986. It was directed by Jim Johnston, who we've already seen before, and I'm, I have a little bit more notes about this. He also directed no- Nobody Lives Forever, Out Where the Buses Don't Run, there's a couple others. The writer is Daniel Pine, who is the main story editor for Miami Vice. He also wrote Heart of Darkness, Little Prince, The Prodigal Son. So those are all episodes that he wrote. So that's where my notes are, and I know normally we go right into talk about us and then dive into the show but i just want to point out really fast this episode was originally written to be a sequel to smugglers blues but they couldn't get glenn fry to come back so instead of jimmy we had jackson i think he read the script <laughs> and he was like no, no <laughs> i don't want to do this i episode. think it's funny that we had that we had jackson because the guy who plays jackson gary cole so you might remember him from being the boss office space lumberg bill lumberg yeah. lumberg <laughs> did you guys know he originally auditioned for the role of sonny crockett before they gave it to don johnson Oh, he had no chance of ever getting that role. <laughs> yeah, just saying. Just saying. Um, I, mean, I don't know. I, don't dream know. I liked him in the episode. Was, oh, no, he was good in the episode. I, but. I, 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 I think he might have made a better Crockett. I don't know. <laughs> John just trying to be controversial. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go ahead and disagree with that. Yeah, no. <laughs> Even throwing in the lumber. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to need your TPS reports on my desk now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're going to need to stay after for that. He was also in uh, a bunch of other stuff, but I also want to point out that he uh, did a voice for 37 episodes of Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law. Really? Yeah, I and thought you knew that. Done, he's also done voices for 38 episodes of Family Guy. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So he's yeah, not just so, Lumberg. That's all we know. No, no, no. No, no. He's been in a bunch of stuff, a bunch of comedies and stuff, and would have made a much better Sonny Crockett. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> digging deep there. Digging deep. John, the wound was open and he just went for it like a boxer with a cut <laughs> over the eye. <laughs> My bigger point here on this is that Smuggler's Blues was a super popular episode. Glenn Fry is like the rock pop person on the charts. He is huge. Miami Vice, huge. They brought in veteran vice director and editor for this for, for this episode. They had a sequel to one of the most popular episodes. This was all hands on deck. They got Tommy Chong, who's like a big time comedian. In 1984, the Corsican Brothers came out, which wasn't exactly a big. I love that movie. Yeah, but it, yeah, I love <laughs> yeah. it too. But it wasn't but it was like as the big as movie. Up in Smoke. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then in 1985, on their comedy album, they released the song "Born in East LA." So. Oh my God! Tommy Chong was obviously big in the news, veteran writer, veteran director, smuggler to one of their big, I mean, a sequel to one of their biggest <laughs> oh, He was <episodes>. a smuggler? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure he was a smuggler too, but no. <laughs> they, no, all stops were pulled for this episode, so we'll see how it performs. The other thing, John, I wanted to ask you on this, because Melissa knows, but and we know from the episode, but when when you read the description, so here's the description as, as I understand it. The plot description was, Croc and Tubbs prevail upon a pilot to stall his retirement from contraband business long enough to con- to connect them with a band of murderous 20th century pirates. John, what was your over under at the beginning of this episode that the person they brought out of retirement was going to get murdered <laughs> on this job? <laughs> oh, I thought it was pretty high. Yeah, I was kind of <laughs> expecting that. And then I was really disappointed when it wasn't Jimmy. I was like, no, Jimmy <laughs> even went out and brought in Noogie for the episode. So I was like, we're going to get a Noogie and Jimmy episode? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, Noogie will only appear like two more times in the series run. Or one more one time. One more time. Yeah. This is, and it was actually, this. there's a story behind that. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, we know the story. Yeah, yeah. He's, so he's... we'll talk about that a little bit more <laughs> at the end of the opening when, when we see the Noogman. Before we get started, I'll check yeah. in to what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, when this episode 
lands, we will be, me and my kids will be at Phoenix Comic Con. And we are excited. And I am nervous bringing a bunch of teenage girls with me to Comic Con. <laughs> yeah, you better watch those girls. You're responsible for them. I'm not there to back you up either. You got yourself on that one. I'm on. I'm on. Just tell me they're going to be dressed up as something like Sailor Moon or something. Tell me they're going to actually be dressed up as something cool. They there was debate about going back and forth before if they were going to be dressed up as Bucky Barnes, aka. Uh, the Winter Soldier. The Winter Soldier. That's who they're into. Oh. They're both into the Winter Soldier, and Isabel is really, 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 really into Captain America. Yeah. They went back and forth on that. Decided ultimately not to dress up because they want to be more comfortable. It's really hot, obviously here. Yeah, so it's Phoenix. <laughs> it's Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it gets hot. It's a like, little easier to dress up up here in Seattle Comic Con. I, I will <laughs> say that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> in fact, sometimes it's so cold I dress like a Wookiee just daily. <laughs> I'm going to keep my eyes peeled for as much Miami Vice stuff as I can get my hands on. I'll report back on what I'm able to get my hands on. <laughs> Some small conference room. Philip Michael Thomas is performing his album. <laughs> hey, for the record, that is where I bought, got my Miami Vice shirt when yep. I was pregnant with our youngest. I got a Miami Vice shirt and it's kittens. It's kittens as Crockett and Tubbs. It's like perfect. It just describes me in one (laughs) t-shirt. It's like two cats dressed up like Crockett and Tubbs and then they're Ferrari in the back. (laughs) Let's go break down this episode because although we've hyped it up quite a bit in the beginning, it's kind of so. (laughs) Kind of boring. (laughs) Let's go talk about this episode. All right, guys. (laughs) Sorry. We open up this episode. With a rap song from Nookie and a man wearing an eye patch. <laughs> <laughs> this episode had so much promise. <laughs> but did it fulfill it? I don't know. Top it all off, the man's name with the eye patch, his name is Captain Hook. Yeah. So, well, he's a pirate, you know? Yes. <laughs> and so they like have this rap song, and then you find out that Captain Hook, is he's actually running a pirate radio station, and he goes and tells Nookie to raise the pirate flag. I don't know how to put this, because Captain Hook is pervasive throughout the whole episode, where he's, he's used like a segue in, in between scenes, where it's like him doing commentary in, in, in between songs. It's almost like in Reservoir Dogs, where they have like the radio the the voice of the radio in between major scenes nowhere near <laughs> reservoir dogs level <laughs> yeah like where they had that classic rock station that they would play in between stuff and even sunny and rico are listening to the radio at the office well mostly they- rico sunny looks like he's not impressed with any of it and doesn't <laughs> look like he understands why they're even listening to it he's like rolling his eyes like whatever <laughs> and then it's montage time and this is less of a montage more like a tourist video for the city of miami <laughs> i don't know it was very strange <laughs> it even Come has to some- miami we're tan and sweaty and we have nice cars <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> it has it even has some shots that are in it that are from the opening it's like it's the same it's the same clips that that, that were used but it, go- it goes on for quite a while. We get to hear the whole Toy Story theme song. As <laughs> well, it's a Randy Newman song, so of course it goes on for a while. <laughs> Those don't end. <laughs> when the music finally turns down, we go to a yacht, and it's two men, two ladies. They're waiting on a shipment of something to come in. It's coming well, no, in. They're not, we're not waiting on a shipment. They're waiting for someone to come pick them up. Yeah, yeah. that's right. They're waiting to give the drugs yes. to someone to named somebody. Jackson, mm-hmm. who's coming in. Yeah, They're waiting, and they're like partying on the boat and waiting for it. While they're waiting, another boat comes pulling up that says Customs on the side of it. But... The people who are on there clearly don't work for customs. I that or it's Trump customs. Like yuppie customs. <laughs> <laughs> they get up alongside and just open fire. Why does customs need an automatic gun mounted on a boat, by the way? I don't know. And that's a big ass gun. Um, yeah, what kind of I gun mean, was that? that? Is like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like that gun could take down airplanes. And the whole time he's just firing away, there's like he's got like a big metal plate, I guess, to protect him from return fire but yes, the whole ricochet time ricochet or something maybe I, like the bullets or I, I, I guess know. but but the whole time i was just thinking like how the hell does he see what he's shooting at <laughs> yeah you can't see past the metal thing yeah <laughs> no like he could just be shooting the water <laughs> <laughs> they totally demolish that boat and then we go to the opening credits when we come back from the opening credits we're back with those 
<laughs> still on the boat. Customs yeah. agents. They climb on board. They're furiously looking through all the cabinets. They're looking through everything. They find up in the ceiling where eight kilos of cocaine have been hidden. There's a lot of bad lines in between yeah, them, too, exchanging, of, like, yeah. Captain pirate jokes <laughs> stuff one guy smokes a cigar the entire time so after they steal the cocaine we see an airplane a seaplane come flying in lands they didn't steal they claim their booty john was waiting <laughs> you, you need it. to start you need to start using the pirate lingo <laughs> he wrote that on his notes and highlighted it waiting for that moment <laughs> the seaplane lands man lumberg or jackson <laughs> no uh, he's lumberg yeah <laughs> Jackson, he gets out of the airplane, he climbs on board, he sees that everyone's been shot up. And I will point out that the, the vice director and this did a good job making sure everyone looked like they were dead, except for the lady at the bottom where they put like a bunch of fake bullet holes in her butt. <laughs> <laughs> She was like right in her butt. Like Yeah, it was like the person who was in charge of doing it just focused solely on one area. Like he was really <laughs> emphasizing this one area. That's where all the organs are in the butt. <laughs> you know, he just really wanted to, the makeup guy just really wanted to touch her butt. It must have been very awkward for her the whole time he was doing it. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, Shouldn't I be shot anywhere else? No, right in the butt. You were running away, remember? <laughs> This is more realistic. <laughs> then when Jackson sees that everyone's dead, instead of fleeing, he decides to steal the sonar equipment. We leave from the yacht and we head back over to the we head over to the precinct. At the precinct, the duo and Castillo are in the basement. They're developing some photos of the of the yes. boat and some other shots. They at least found that boat three or four days later. And then they also say that that's when the that was in the same time period when that customs boat was stolen. They found the custom boat run aground on some beach in the Keys, and that boat, the yacht, had been seen in Cartagena a few days even earlier than that, so they know it must have been a drug-running boat. So the person who stole the customs boat was, it was a, like a steal, a, a kill them and steal the drugs that were on this drug running boat. I don't know. Not that obvious. I would say that, you know, being vice, that it's, it, especially Miami vice, you know, they have to deal with some hookers, but apparently pirates also fall under their scope. <laughs> well, it, I mean, you guys are always giving them crap. It's actually a drug deal. So that goes where they go <laughs> for once in their life. This actually is where they're I, I, supposed I'm just to saying, be. Yeah. You would think it would be falling in the jurisdiction of like the FBI. Yeah, but the drugs and the um, like the stolen goods, that goes on land and that's being sold in their jurisdiction. True. So. <laughs> I just love Castillo at the end of the scene where it's like, like, Pirates, damn it. I know. I did love that part. And then Tubbs is like, pirates? Like, what are you talking about, pirates? <laughs> well, a little bit later. So Cat, Cat Castillo says that the B team is working on chasing on the sonar equipment. When do they, they set up the sting to buy the sonar? And so what watching he says the. In that part, he said that um, Switek and Vito already have. Oh, have so had it already set, happened. That's what they do. Yeah. Like, so when they're not, like, just think that when they're not doing surveillance or when they're not. Um, pretending to be someone else a warehouse <laughs> worker or i don't know whatever mm -hmm. they have that they have that chop shop basically set up where people mm -hmm. could come and sell things oh to yeah them, that's remember? right that's right that's how we meet noogie too yeah. that's right and that's yeah, how why that tub shot. is like that's not how i would do the video surveillance and that's not yeah. how we do it in new york or whatever something stupid yeah <laughs> and that's also in this video is where we see they have done a transaction there's a there's um footage of or security tape yeah. footage from the from the chop shop of them of a person trying to sell them the sonar equipment and it's tommy chong yeah and you can tommy right chong away, from I'm like, like a tommy mile chong. away yeah. yes <laughs> he goes by jumbo in this episode so i'm just gonna refer to him as jum jum because that's also what <laughs> what fluffy calls him yeah too. <laughs> yeah she calls him jum jum yeah <laughs> Of course, after seeing him on the security footage, that's who we're going to go see right now. They do all hop in the Ferrari and head down to the airplane junkyard. Is that what he runs? It's just airplanes, right? They don't have yeah, boats or cars or anything. It's yeah. just airplanes. Yeah. As soon as the duo pulls up, they hear some shooting, and it's the woman, Fluffy, Jum Jum's wife, who's shooting rats with a Mac 10. I don't know. <laughs> in the junkyard. And she's like, don't worry about it. I know how to shoot this thing. And this slaps a dead rat sticker on the side of their rv i could that she's counted all the rats she's got by those stickers <laughs> or you could just clean your rv but you know that just seems like that's too easy i guess <laughs> you don't have that many rats the duo introduced themselves as burnett and cooper they're looking for jump jump 
they know that he recently sold some jump sonar. Jump's not here, man. <laughs> <laughs> there is no jump jump. <laughs> their pitch here is that it was their sonar equipment. They want jump jump's help. And that's when Fluffy turns the gun on and says, I think y'all should leave now. And Tubbs pulls, he finally pulls out the shot, the sawed off. The sawed yeah. off makes a return. It came out quick, like, too. He was ready. <laughs> yeah. And then when Tubbs has the sawed off, the Fluffy, Fluffy's like, I'll still shoot him. And Tubbs is like, go ahead, shoot him. <laughs> and, and, you know, I believed him. I believe Tubbs would actually let her shoot him. I know. Did you see Crockett's face? He was like, what the hell? And he looked at him like, what? Tubbs just got that goofy smile on his face like yeah yeah he looks so happy i to need pull a new that partner gun. yeah he looked happy to pull out that gun too like got you well jump jump eventually says that he was supposed to buy eight kilos this pilot was the one that was going to give it to him it wasn't his idea though to deal with morales the people who had been shot and killed on the yacht or deal with a pilot it was a recommendation from a buddy of his captain hook and that he set up the deal with his pilot, who was then going to get the drugs from from Morales, and then he was going to get in that Jackson had so the pilot had stolen the sonar equipment and given it to Jum Jum, so he could try and recoup some of his losses because now he's just out the money for eight kilos. So one, Tommy Chong is Canadian, which uh, I, always I always forget. I always blows my mind when I find that out. <laughs> <What>? Yeah, <laughs> uh-uh. yeah. But I, I, I was looking up some stuff because I mean, obviously the Cheech and Chong connection and spent all the weed stuff with Tommy Chong. But did you know he made an appearance in Nash Bridge in an episode of Nash Bridges? Cheech. Really? Yeah, I, um, I, I remember that episode. In that episode, that was like the you know he reunited with Cheech, especially because they had split since about 1987, and in that same episode. Guess who guest stars and reunites with Don Johnson? No way. That yes. same episode has Philip Michael Thomas in it, too? Yes. Yes. No it's way. like a reunion episode. <laughs> uh, like, I must see this Nash Bridges episode because it's at this point, Don Johnson and Philip Th- uh, Michael Thomas haven't done anything in like 10 years together. The same thing with Cheech and Chong. Since 87, I, I want to say the episode was in the mid 90s. So like, for eight or nine years, they hadn't really done anything together. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's really what I thought it was. And that's crazy that they were all in that same mm-hmm. And it was episode. hyped up. Hugely oh, hyped yeah? up. It was like all over the place. Like I wonder if he got be... if Phil Michael Thomas got to keep that sawed off and that little belt loop remember. that he's got for it. <laughs> I don't remember. Like I vaguely remember them like riding around like like driving around in the car and having like Don Johnson drive like erratically and like and having Tubbs be like <laughs> with the same look on his face like why haven't you learned how to drive and Cheech and Chong were just themselves like yeah for the record I love Nash Bridges because obviously I love Don Johnson and there's nothing he can't do that I don't want to watch and I love Cheech Marin so it's yeah. like a win-win like what go, how'd you go wrong there uh-huh. and it's in San Francisco you know and I'm saying. <laughs> so the duo they have their connection now they figure out that Jum Jum's connection is with Captain Hook so now it's time to go out and go actually talk to Captain Hook. And we will see Jump Jump one more time. And I'm sure we have more comments about Tommy Chong and especially that scene. That, that we was see. a weird scene. Yeah. <laughs> and that whole thing is kind of strange. So we'll yeah. come back to that in a second here. First, we're going to stop off at the pirate radio because this is another really odd scene. I think there's some information John, that you'll have on the Nook Man too. Because when we get out there to Captain Hook's place, his, first of all, we see that Captain Hook's girlfriend is working out on a bike. All and the, the time. Nook, yeah, and the Nook man comes over to her and says, girl, you better start working out hard. You know, Captain Hook doesn't like any cellulite. <laughs> oh, Nookie, 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 Nookie. Harsh, Nook Hello, man. Nookie. Harsh. <laughs> I really cannot stand Nookie. Like, he was always like the worst part of the show for me. I'm like, oh, great. Here he comes. <laughs> So the duo pulling up and Nogi sees them. And he, what's amazing is that he doesn't say anything. He doesn't say that they're cops. Has the Nook Man just forgot? Like, has he been away long enough that he's forgot that they're not actually Cooper and Burnett? I don't he know. Really he really doesn't interact with them at all. It, well, minus like one or two scenes that are kind of directed to the group. Nogi really just kind of stands there quietly. Doesn't say nothing. And he's definitely not the same Nook Man. Like his... Even though he's talking the same, like his delivery and stuff is not the same. And I think that this is what you're going to talk about, John, is that you can feel the tension between Don Johnson and Noogie in this scene. And that's because in real yeah. life, there they was that tension. Yeah, there was tension. They didn't like each other. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess on set during this episode, Noogie like 
blew up like a drug field uh, rant towards Don Johnson. And Don Johnson basically said, I refuse to work with this guy. I'm not going to be on camera with him again. So we only see Noogie about like two more times in the entire series. And every scene he's in, Don Johnson is not. And the... Oh, the scene, the, the, next, the last episode he's in, I'm just going to say it right now, is the most ridiculous episode you will ever see of anything <laughs> on TV. It is so ridiculous. <laughs> For the record, I have seen Miami Vice. I think this is my this is my actual sixth time going through it all the way again. And I only watch that episode once. I always skip it. <laughs> so that should tell you right there. You can tell the tension between them. And you can see like... Just the way the scene ends, it just cuts out. Just abruptly cuts out. Almost like that was when Noogie just went off at dawn and they just had it out there. Just, they just cut it out and uh, like used the first half of the scene. I wonder if the scene was like even longer, but that's why it cuts out at that random spot. And oh. was there more Captain Hook and Noogie in this episode, but they cut it? Because, because they were together. Yeah. Yeah. From what I read, I guess they were saying that Noogie for a long time, the, the person who played Noogie, was having drug problems for a long time. And so he was showing up like late and like being really unprofessional. And everybody was saying he was being unprofessional and showing up late and not doing what he was supposed to do. I mean, obviously the icing on the cake was that when your your main character or star says like, I'm not gonna work with that person, Mm -hmm. then what are you gonna do? You can't really put him in there anymore. On the latter side, Richard Belzer, who plays Captain Hook, actually has a connection with Charlie Barnett. They did a comedy video called Terms of Enrollment. We got to find that. (laughs) Yeah. So Richard Belzer, comedian and actor who played Detective John Munch or Sergeant John Munch. He's been playing him since 1993. He was playing that character on Homicide Life on the Street. And then it's the same character. Mm -hmm. But not just that. He is one of the most epic cop characters ever because he also played that same character in episodes of The X-Files, regular Law and Order, Unordered Trial by Jury. He appeared as that character in The Wire. He appeared as that character in Arrested Development. He literally has appeared as John Munch in on five different networks up to 23 seasons the only other character in tv history to ever ever be the same character on multiple tv shows for over 20 years is kelsey grammer's frazier yeah yeah there's nothing that's even close to what belzer has done with that character yeah yeah and he'll go back because they just made he just retired from the police force he could still appear as that character in other tv shows or in uh, other Law and Order shows, he's just got he's got it cornered on that. But in this episode, he de- like this is like the last time we see any interaction with Captain Hook. We don't see Noogie at all for the rest of the episode. And Captain Hook and or Belzer in this episode, he doesn't. We don't see we see him in those lead ins in, in between scenes where he's talked about music and stuff. But there's no more interactions with him throughout the rest of the episode. It just seems like such a waste of uh, his character, actually. So now that Crockett and Tubbs have their connection, they know they're gonna, they have a connection with Jackson. They're, they're, they're going to go see him. They have everything set up now where they they have this crazy plan where they're going to use Jackson to get to the pirates to get a boat. So well, let's go over and meet Jackson for, for the first time. They pull up to the hangar and when they get out of the car, Tubbs says, this place looks really familiar. Like you don't remember the time you got in an airplane and flew to a different country with this crazy asshole who then set you up and then you guys had to shoot your way out of it. You don't remember this hangar? Come on, guys. He didn't and, set him up. It wasn't <laughs> Jimmy that set him up, though. Well, his people were the ones that set him up. It was his, his, his mechanic, up. yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wait a minute yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, it was his people. Don't be taking... It wasn't Jimmy's fault. He saved him <laughs> in the end. He took a bullet. <laughs> 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 and as soon as the duo walk in, Jackson recognizes them as Cooper and Burnett. He's like, I remember what happened with Jimmy. It took him two months to recover. He's on the straight and narrow now. So, and then five minutes later, would be like, okay, I'm in. What do you guys want to yeah, do? Exactly. <laughs> Although, what, okay, so wait, if he's on yeah. the straight and narrow, why can't he still work on planes? Like, <laughs> I don't understand that part. <laughs> I just love he's flying like a drone before there were any, there was uh, any such thing as a drone. Like he's flying like a giant helicopter. Yeah, and that's supposed to be his in. his day job. Remote control helicopters? That's yeah. what he repairs? I think that's what he's trying to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Barnett and Coop need to come up with different aliases <laughs> because everybody knows who they are now. But apparently, according as Melissa told us, they will not. 
come up with different aliases. No, they will not. <laughs> well, you know, it's amazing because Jackson talks about how Jimmy told them him about them. How come Jimmy didn't mention the fact that they're cops? I don't know. This whole episode is a mystery. Like why no one mentions that. The, the people who know that they're cops don't mention that they're cops. Because that would ruin the story. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you guys not getting this. <laughs> you guys keep saying that. They pinky promised. So as Cooper and Burnett, they pitch to him, okay, we want to do some business with it. He says, hey, let's go get some, let's go get a drink. In between them heading over to the bar, we see Jum Jum with Fluffy and the pirates who have Coke that they would like to sell to Jum Jum. And Jum Jum makes the comment, hey, this is kind of weird. I had a friend who got killed who had eight kilos. Then you guys just come out of nowhere and you guys got eight kilos that, that you want to sell me. And of course, it's because Jum Jum has set up a sting. The pirates try to work around and rob jum jum but jum jum has also ready to rob these guys so it was a double double cross yes fluffy was ready to go she was hiding away it's got her man's back yeah yeah exactly yeah i mean she she really does have his back i don't know whether there's any women better than miami vice and then this Pops is where out of nowhere with that gun <laughs> yeah i know so yeah they they initially set up where Jum Jum sees the drugs, like, okay, these are good. Let's go walk over to this part of the junkyard where I'll give you the money. One of the pirates tries to sneak around, but Fluffy's waiting, gets him at gunpoint, and then she comes up with him and says, hey, it was a double cross. But meanwhile, they had the money that they were going to give these pirates was like way up above on a junker airplane. Tommy, or not Tommy, but Jum Jum is like, I don't know what you guys are trying to pull here. And then Fluffy just yells out, I don't even Look know out, what she yells jum out. Jum like, or something like, like that. Watch and out, Jum Jum. Yeah, and then she shoots up in the air. Uh huh. And then the bag rips open and the money falls out all over the place. And then people scatter and then it's like, what the? <laughs> yeah, Jum Jum doesn't grab the briefcase of drugs. He just pushes the man down that has the briefcase <laughs> of drugs. <laughs> it's like, well, when, when Fluffy already got the drop on one of them. She's got one of them at gunpoint. Like, at that point, just take the drugs and the money and go. <laughs> you know, like she, gets, she got but, spooked by something that says she saw something. Well, I don't know what the deal is. That's a weird scene. I don't know. When J Jump Jump and Fluffy run off, the pirates decide not to chase. Like, no, don't chase. We'll never find him in there. Don't worry. It was fake money anyway. And then that's like the end of Jump Jump. We don't see him again for the rest of the ep or Fluffy for the rest of the episode. He really wanted to see yeah. Fluffy again, didn't you? <laughs> So yeah, I don't know why, why, why we came back to Jumbo then after he said he did his job for the for the plot where he said that I got the information from Captain Hook and then Captain Hook points him to Jackson. Why we needed to come back and close out Jump Jump's story because they needed more of Tommy Chong in that episode, and so they're like, let's just throw it in there. Yeah, we'll maybe make it was any all sense. that noogie stuff they cut out. They had to yeah, fill maybe, some time. maybe they're like, hey, we gotta go back and reshoot this. <laughs> maybe that was supposed to be a prequel to Nice Dreams. <laughs> maybe somehow they all leave, and the briefcase stays there, and Pee Wee Herman gets it. <laughs> <laughs> We bounce from Jump Jumps, we head over to Raul's, where the duo and Jackson are getting a drink. Jackson is still insisting he's retired. He's not He's not interested in doing any more smuggling. What What about Morales? He's like, well, I, I was stuck. I had to do a deal for somebody I didn't want out. You know, Jackson is saying the whole time here, he wants out. And he also says, which is a great line, he says, Burnett and Cooper aren't... A, quote, ain't anybody's rabbit foot either. And their faces are like, nope, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> they look at each other like, yeah, he's actually right. We're not that good at this. <laughs> and then Jackson yeah. gives in when he said, when he finds out that Cooper and Burnett want to do is get to those pirates. So I guess he's in it for revenge. Yeah, he's then? in it for revenge because like he feels responsible. I think when, when he found those bodies, when he found that lady that was shot in the butt, <laughs> it was supposed, <laughs> it was supposed to indicate that he was really shooken up about that because mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he hang, he held his head pretty low after he saw those butt bullets. <laughs> I mean, and I think that you know, if Sonny somehow ends up getting killed in this episode, Jackson could replace Sonny as Tubbs' partner, like what was originally <laughs> supposed to happen. <laughs> and the series could continue. <laughs> So they leave from the bar and they head back over to Jackson's hangar. He shows them his fancy airplane. It's like, look, look at my baby. Look at my baby airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like some kind of innuendo for his penis? <laughs> he shows him his fancy airplane. And this is when Crockett pitches his what their plan is, where they're going to use Jackson to get to the pirates so they can get a boat 
<laughs> to move to sell guns to people in South in Central America. It's a very elaborate plan for Miami Vice. It's like, needlessly complicated. Yeah. What? <laughs> Why don't you just sell? You're going to sell? Say you're going to buy drugs or something? They have drugs already, don't they? <laughs> like I don't understand. How about this? How about you just follow Jackson until he bumps into them and then arrest them? Exactly. Like, well, he seems I mean, to be in business that's not a co- that's not undercover work though. <laughs> <laughs> I would have given it a pass then if they it was the Jamaican the tubs. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> after they pitch the idea, after a little bit of dancing around, Jackson eventually says that he's in. He'll be willing to help out. And his girlfriend comes walking in. And she's all mad because she's like, you're supposed to take me to Arclight. And Jackson says he needs to go get the deal started to go find these pirates. He's like, why don't you go with Cooper and Burnett to Arclight? You guys are going to love it. Now... In the same evening, after getting drinks at Raul's, they're now going to take Jackson's girlfriend, Lonnie, out to Arclight, which is an arcade bar. Well, I wouldn't understand. I, I first so thought, like, me, are they trying just, to say she's underage or something? No, what is going on? <laughs> I, I got that feeling, too. But let me just summarize this scene. Tubbs and Crockett take her to Chuck E. Cheese. Everybody <laughs> has pizza and drinks. <laughs> they play some video games, a little space invaders. She tells them how Jackson has boldly gone where no man has gone before. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody snickers to themselves because they know uh, uh, because of the sexual innuendo. <laughs> and then eventually Jackson shows up and they stick him with the bill because it's <laughs> crappy cardboard pizza. And nobody got any tickets for that either. <laughs> well, she also no. drops that she, when she turns 22, she's going to get a $13 million trust fund but, cashed out Yeah, and to just her. says, it, but he's not, he doesn't even care about that. Yeah, yeah. While all this is happening, Jackson is at this drug crash house talking to someone who's like a friend of his, I think, that's like strung out on heroin. And he's going to go try and talk to her to find out where he can be in contact with the, with these pirates. In the middle of that conversation. And dude, it starts out as a really heavy scene. You, you, you've got Leonard Skinner's That Smell playing. He buys a needle for her. He goes up. He's trying to get, get her lucid enough to talk to him. And then it just gets silly. Because <laughs> a man comes up, like a bodyguard and a man named Lalo, Lalo, Lalo come up. And he's, it's basically it's Morales' brother. And he's like, every time someone comes in contact with you, they die, including the people on my brother's boat. They're going to, it looks like they're going to stab him. They're going to attack him. And then Skip, who Skip. we find out his name is Skip. Skip I'm sorry, that name. And Skip. his band of merry men <laughs> yeah. come to his rescue and throw Lalo and his bodyguard over the edge of the second story floor. And that's when Jackson finally puts it together that Skip, he's actually looking for. But these two know each other. And Skip also happens to be Lonnie's brother. Yep. Spoiler. So are you kidding me? Rich kid pirates? Like, really? (laughs) Aren't we done with the whole rich kid thing? You know what? I didn't even put it together in the very beginning. Hold on. Let me go back up here. The writer also wrote, Daniel Pine also wrote Little Prince. Yeah. What about rich kids? Yeah. He's a rich kid. What does this guy have against rich kids? <laughs> Maybe he's not. It's not what he has against them. It's what he was. Maybe he was a rich kid and a little. Oh, I, I, I bet be. you he like worked at the cafeteria in Yale and worked yeah. his way through college, and he's all pissed <laughs> off. <Yeah. laughs> so Perry Lang uh, is the guy that plays the pirate captain. Um, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, yeah, he's appeared in different shows and stuff, but nothing consistent that you can really point to he's directed a bunch of stuff he essentially the guy that wrote and directed the episode he directed in that capacity he directed one episode of this tv show one episode of that tv show three and Uh this one but he directed four episodes of dawson's creek and one episode of one tree hill (gasps) <gasps> oh my god now i'm listening i was gonna yes. say is that why john brought this up because of dawson's creek but wait a minute one tree hill now we're see? talking <laughs> see so what jackson sees that it's skip is the lead of is the lead pirate here he's like no way like what like, he makes some jokes about him being too rich and then skip he goes on this pitch that all sounds very familiar for follow modern politics too where he equates the central american or south american low lowlifes are ruining america and they breed like cockroaches like you asshole yeah whatever yeah exactly. whatever I-, I love how jackson sets him up for the deal too you know hey you want to buy a boat <laughs> oh, damn yeah. it we're gonna buy a boat <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, they hold Jackson at gunpoint. Like, you're going to set us up with these guys who want to buy a boat. The next scene is my favorite scene of the episode, which is funny to say because there's, like bu- uh, there's still a bunch of action happening. But it's all because of this one line. Jackson has put together now that it's Lonnie, his girlfriend's brother, who's might be too dangerous for Cooper and Burnett. So he goes... He takes them back out to the bar and says, I think we should back out on this deal. I don't like these guys. The deal aren't hearing anything of it. But when we first come into this scene, Jackson is at the jukebox and he says, hey, hey, you guys got a favorite TV soundtrack you want to hear? How meta, Miami Vice. How meta can you be that the Miami Vice soundtrack was number one for like 16 weeks, 18 weeks in 1986? It was the number one album on the Hot 100 and had, and the Miami Vice theme song was the number one Hot 100 as well. Just way to rub it in. You know what? Uh, I would love to hear Tubbs or someone say like, yeah, play the Knight Rider theme. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love boat. Play the love boat theme. <laughs> I just like that, you know, they were trying to sneak that past that they were that they were gonna make a reference to their own soundtrack in one of the episodes. Yeah, exactly. Go Jane Hammer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the man. Jackson tries to call it off the duo. It's like, whatever, we're not hearing of it. Go go get this thing done. The next day at the hangar, the duo will come walking in, and this is another reference to the to another Miami Vice after Smuggler's Blues. The duo walk in and Crockett calls out. Earth to Jackson, which is exactly when the first time they met Jimmy, they come walking in. He's playing the guitar up on top of the hangar. He's not listening. Like, we haven't seen that as Glenn Fry yet. And he says, Earth to Jimmy. And Jimmy spins around. And it's and Glenn we see, Fry. And we see that it's Glenn Fry. It's what they say next that I love. Tubbs goes, not a peg leg among them. Crockett <laughs> goes, maybe they're working up to that. <laughs> Yeah, because the pirates come repelling down from the ceiling and hold them at gunpoint. Yeah, yeah. This is where Skip says, this is how the deal is going to go down. You guys are going to get your guns and you're going to $60,000 and you're going to take it to Jackson. Jackson's going to fly you out to our boat. Then we're going to give you the boat. That way Jackson's the middleman. So, But now he's stuck in. He's the middleman here everyone leaves jackson's just left he wanted out but he's still stuck in there and this is how that's how the deal is going to go down so this leaves jackson in a weird spot he from the beginning never really wanted to be involved in this and then when he set it up he thought maybe he would just set it up and get out so but now he's stuck in he has to be the middleman on this deal because of skip and so he's over at lonnie's house and he's complaining about he thinks that cooper and burnett are going to get hurt and lonnie's like Quit complaining. I need to get a wedding dress. I'm already yeah, late on getting like, a wedding dress. Pick out, help me pick out this wedding dress and they'll be fine. Basically, yeah. like they're big boys. They can handle themselves. We're not worried about them. First, I wanted to write this scene off. I just would have skipped it. But this scene is really important because of how it ends. Because she's always yeah, listening yeah. to what Jackson's talking about. Mm-hmm. She pretends like she's not, right? She acts like a ditz. She doesn't really understand what's going on. All that stuff she talked about with... Um, Cooper and Burnett that where she's like telling him like, oh, did you know that he did this? And that's like all these crazy stories he's told her that he like Mm -hmm. fought the freedom fighters and he did all this like humanitarian work and he did all this crazy stuff and she acts like she believes it. She's not that stupid. She's listening. Because at the time when I was watching the the scene, like Dominic said, I was just writing it off like, ah, blah, blah. This is just filler. And I actually wrote down. His girl is du- his is um is a post, but she's a but she's kind of right here about <laughs> him uh, about uh, him just going through with it. But I actually made note of the fact that she is dumb as dumb as a post. <laughs> So I find out I am wrong. <laughs> well, and I mentioned it. In the, if we're in a couple scenes, we'll get to it where Crockett has to admit it too. At the precinct, we see a quick team meeting where Castillo doesn't like how the steel is going to go down, but the B team are going to be a, their only backup at the airport. And when, once the airplane leaves from there, they won't have any backup. So we go over to yeah, the hangar. Yeah, it seems like a pretty stupid plan to me. <laughs> it's not even a real plan. The B team's just going to kind of hang out. And then once you guys leave, you're kind of on your own. I, I feel like someone should have broke out a chalkboard. <laughs> yeah, something. Need some of that red yarn to connect things together. They just weren't connecting it. <laughs> so now we're at the second to last scene here. We're going to stop off at the hangar. This is where they're going to load up the airplane. This is the most important scene where the twist comes in. And the it twist. got me too. Like it, it, totally, it totally shocked me. They're at the airport. They're loading up the guns into Jackson's airplane. 
Jackson is saying, look, guys, like we should back out. These guys are dangerous. This isn't worth it. I don't want to be a part of this. I'm getting married in just a few weeks. Like we should we should get out. Crockett and, and Tubbs are adoring him. They're loaded up the guns. Crockett's getting ready to put a strap a gun to his ankle. Then Lonnie turns, pulls a gun out of her purse and says, my brother was right when he said that you were going to get soft. And she tells Crockett and Tubbs to put the keep loading the guns up and then get into the airplane. Surprise. Lonnie has been working for her brother, and that's might be why they use Jackson or why they get in, they have information about what like where people are, where drug jobs are happening and stuff. It's because she's the like the mole for, for the smuggler. And then she turns it on. She goes from Ditsy to Scarface in a matter of two seconds. She's ruthless. She's mm-hmm. ready to shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> and dude seems too busy playing with their funny hats in the airplane to even take notice. <laughs> They were funny. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, now that I know, I'm not going to spoil it here, but I know what's going to happen to that team. Switek is the is a dumbass. He's like reading the book and wearing that goofy airplane hat. And Zito's saying, I can't, I have a hard time seeing through this glass. Like, basically, we're in a bad spot. We shouldn't be here. He's like really trying to do his job. Yeah. And Switek is like eating Twinkies and looking through the airplane book and wearing his leather aviator hat and stuff <laughs> he's wearing that stupid hat on his head he can't see out of it yeah this is when crockett turns he has his hands up and he says now i feel dumb because he sees that lonnie was the one like they weren't none of them were paying any attention to lonnie and so like all of us they weren't even we trying were to nail her guard. either none of the them were duo, to have no one saw her. this coming jackson crockett yeah. the audience no one saw this coming Especially not you, because mm-hmm. you were like, "What?" <laughs> you watched it. You guessed. So. They all climb in the tr- in the plane. I was gonna say the train. They all climb into the plane <laughs> and they take off. <laughs> toot, toot. <laughs> <laughs> and they take off. They land at Lonnie and Skip's house at their at the mansion and Rich skip people. is angry he's like, "Why did you bring them here? Why didn't you just kill them at the airport?" So that's how much faith Skip had in Lonnie. He thought that Shush is going to kill them all at the airport, not like escort them so that they can kill them. But no, he thought for sure. He thought, he thought that Lonnie was going to kill them all. Yeah, he was and like, they just come the back with the guns. You've done it already before. No. <laughs> They're bickering and they go to check the money thing. And of course, it's filled with flour or something that explodes <laughs> up in their face. And we get the most awesome Crockett roll and throw I have ever seen. He grabs one of them rolls and chucks him into the ocean. Meanwhile, in the confusion, I guess Crockett and J- uh, Jimmy are left to fight the rest of the pirates. Tubbs and Jackson. Sorry, Jackson. I, uh, <laughs> I was see, like, that's how much I miss Jimmy. <laughs> J- Jimmy was there in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy would have got shit done. That's what, that's why. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he does like a Austin Powers roll with one guy into the ocean who like <laughs> apparently can't swim. He's just like, oh, and then he rolls behind the bar, misses one gun, then magically appears with a, with a gun in his hand. Yeah, anyway. that's the best part. Like, <laughs> yes. you, want, you guys want to reshoot that? Nah, we're good. No one will notice it. It is a quick little fight there, too. I will say that. And Lonnie turns to go shoot Tubbs, but Jackson comes running up right at the right time. He spins around, fires his flare gun, shoots and kills skip and then this the action is over they have everyone uh either dead or or i guess everyone's dead except for lonnie they have lonnie under arrest now they should have killed her too (laughs) (laughs) yeah so i have an issue with that because that's the scene ends and they get back on the airplane and fly off and they just leave uh skip floating dead in the pool which i think is kind of mean because i'm pretty sure that's his dad's house <laughs> um <laughs> yeah so your son's dead but what if i got crocket through in the ocean they don't got time to stop for him he should learn to swim did, did we just not see it did they fish him out and arrest him is there an awkward wet plane ride back <laughs> what happens is that crockett pitches to jackson like hey you can start totally over we'll put you into witness protection essentially you can start a new life well he's yes, gonna have to now <laughs> and Jackson's like he right right before then he puts it like okay you guys are cops and then Jackson gets gets in his plane he flies away and that's when we see it in the sunset he's flying off so it's just Jackson that flies away so maybe that's why there's there's still cops 
that oh, yeah, Tubbs and Crockett are still there. So that's why they're not. That's why they don't leave. Yeah. And then yeah. they did pan out and then you see the guy floating in the pool and then you see that you don't see the other guy that fell in the ocean or whatever. But it's supposed to be like insinuated that he flew away, but they stayed to do their job, which was oh, get okay. a giant net and then fish out that dead body. No, I'm <laughs> 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 you get like one of those pool skimmers circle. <laughs> <laughs> then we just freeze frame on the plane and the sunset and then the episode's over now, i do i did miss a point here in the last in the end here where there's a couple lines where they mention that they're trust they're trust fund they, babies they throw that out there and, a lot. So, and they're pirates so that's how we get our name trust fund pirates we get trust it fund you're babies. rich <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you're rich we get it director you yeah. weren't <laughs> well this was this was you know, I'm gonna save. I'm gonna save that. Save your commentary. I'm gonna save the commentary save for 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 the for the end of the episode. Let's go over and talk about this music. Okay, John. There's some big names in here, especially Leonard Skinner. So, what do you got for us this week in music? This is like two episodes of music. This is seven different songs. I'm gonna try and smash through. So in order to make things simple, I'm going to knock a few out of the way right away. We are going to start with, and this is going to be out of order, but just, just going to get through it. We are going to start with What You Need by NXS, which they had songs in the episodes The Glades and also the episode Walk Alone. And also, and if you really want to know about NXS, please listen to our episode breakdown of Payback. Season 2, episode 19, in which I went way on way too long about them at the end. <laughs> there is plenty of information about I- in excess. So we, yeah, definitely go back to episode 19 and go listen to uh, the, all the stuff about in excess. But there's nothing I'm going to say in this segment that I didn't already say in that segment. Let's move on to the second song, La Miranda by F- Philip Michael Thomas. It was released really? in 19... 19- <laughs> It was released in 1985 on the album Living the Book of Life, sold poorly, and failed to produce a single hit. I I have to say it again. I have to say it again. (laughs) Moving on, we have Still in the Game by Steve Winwood. He's a British singer-songwriter, and he is also going to be featured in our music in... Upcoming episodes, Down for the Count, Part 1, by Hooker by Crook, and A Bullet for Crockett. So, I will have to talk about this guy three times. So, I am going to mention one thing all three times. (laughs) He began his career by joining the Spencer Davis Group and wrote their hits, Give Me Some Lovin' and I Am a Man. Find out more in future music episodes. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. Hey, you know what, though? We're off to a strong start here. In excess, Steve Winwood. We know that the Pretenders and Leonard Skinner are coming up. What a yeah, what a big music. music lineup this one is. I love how you just skipped over Paul, Philip Michael Thomas too. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean he was there too, but <laughs> we love Philip Michael Thomas as Ricardo Tubbs. Not as Philip Michael Thomas, yes. the singer. <laughs> yes. But for the record, I do love Don Johnson, the singer. So. <laughs> yes, yes. But we have talked numerous times <laughs> about how much we love Tubbs and how much he's the only real cop on Miami Vice. <laughs> so yeah, that's questionable. <laughs> that him yes. and Trudy are the are the only people who are actually able to do their jobs. <laughs> Moving on, our next song is "Heaven" by Simply Red. They are an English pop Damn. band. Damn. Mm-hmm. We will also see them in future music segments from episodes Vikings Bikers from Hell, The Good Caller, and also in By Hooker by Crook. So, uh, (laughs) similar to Steve (laughs) Winwood. I can't get over how bad the episode names are for in the in the next three seasons band formed in 1985 from the leftovers of a band called the frantic elevators which is just awesome <laughs> <laughs> they're originally named red because of the singer's red hair but then creative differences led to being called simply red because uh, that, i guess that sounded better we will talk about more about them in future music segments <laughs> Our next song is Miami by Randy Newman. 
He's a songwriter, a singer, songwriter, and arranger, composer. He comes from, he has like, his whole family is full of music composers. Uncles and cousins and stuff that all composed music for movies. He actually started out in the early 60s working with artists like Gene Pitney and the OJs. In 1968, he released his self Title debut album. His second one would produce the song Mama Told Me Not to Come, which would be later covered by Three Dog Night. In 1972, his album Sail Away produced the song Burn On, which is the opening theme to the movie Major League. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and You Can't Leave Your Hat On, which was later covered by Tom Jones. His breakthrough album came in 1974 with Good Old Boys, which made the top 40. His 1983 album, Trouble in Paradise, produced I Love Miami, which is still used at Dodgers games today. And this song, Miami by Vice. Between he literally sings what two- he sees. <laughs> <laughs> so he released three more albums from 88 to 2008, but from that time on, he's mostly known for his music, uh, for his soundtrack music, basically. Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., Cars, anything Pixar. There's a bunch of other movies in there, but I mean, pretty much anything Pixar has Randy Newman's voice uh, singing in it. Now that brings us to the two main topics, the two people that was very hard to actually bring their music down because we have Space Invaders by The Pretenders, who are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They're an English rock band formed in Hereford, England in 1978. The original members consisted of Chrissy Hind on vocals, James Honeyman Scott on guitar, Pete Farndon on bass, and Michael Chambers on drums. I bring that up because the lineup has changed considerably over the years. But starting at the beginning, Hind originally moved from Ohio to London in 73, she was briefly involved in early versions of The Clash and the band The Damned. Wow. Then she played in a couple short-lived bands called The Masters of the Backside. <laughs> Essentially, Dave Hill, this record producer, heard her music. He brought her in and they recorded this demo with a couple random artists, including Phil Taylor of Motorhead, before eventually they built the band The Pretenders. Their debut album, which was self-titled, came out in 79. It was a a critical and commercial success in both the UK and US. Their 81 EP saw hits that included Message of Love, Talk of the Town, and Porcelain, among others. So now what we're going to get to is kind of the interesting part. In June 1982, uh, Fardon was fired from the band after his heroin use had gotten out of control. Two days later, Honeyman Scott died of heart failure from cocaine intolerance. Wow. So they were just picking on people? Like, your drug use has to go, but this drug use is tolerated. Yeah, exactly. Literally two days later, this guy died from doing too much cocaine. Very next year, Fardon, who was basically still di- kind of distraught from, from losing his friend and stuff, he would drown in his bathtub after shooting up heroin. After that, the band continued through the 80s, changing members on and off until they finally got a permanent lineup together because, you know, obviously two members are dead. And this is pretty much where Chrissy Hind kind of just takes over the band. From 86, she puts together another couple members, puts together, puts out another couple albums. By the end of the tour off of one of the albums, she adds keyboardist Bernie Worrell. They continued to have success through the 90s, and they actually managed to go like five or six years without replacing members. Then pretty much the same thing. From 93 on, it was just firing and firing members until they would get inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2005. Let's move on to the song That Smell by Leonard Skinner. Do you see how I said Wade that? <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Skinner, uh, you know, they're known as a Southern rock band. They were actually formed in 1964, not from Alabama, but as a band called My Backyard in Jacksonville, Florida. Mm, that's pretty, that's not too far. Close ish. Not, not too far. Not too far. So. They were also known early on as the Noble Five and 1% before becoming uh, Leonard Skinner, which is like a mocking tribute to their former PE teacher at Get This, 
Robert E. Lee High School. Uh-huh. And I guess he had a policy of boys not having long hair. So he used to harass them. Uh-huh. But later on, they would actually bring him up at, to introduce them at concerts and stuff. But they actually mm. real guy named Leonard Skinner. <laughs> the original members and were all teenage friends were made up of Ronnie Van Zant, Bob Burns, Alan Collins... Gary Rossington, and Larry Junstrom. uh, That will become important later on. Early in the 70s, they broke out of Jacksonville and began touring the South. Junstrom would leave the band. He'd briefly be replaced by Greg T. Walker and drummer vocalist Ricky Medlock, who I guess Ricky Medlock's grandpa was the inspiration to the song Ballad of Curtis Lowe. But Medlock and Walker would later leave, and they would make a band called Blackfoot. Leon Wilkerson would replace Walker on bass, and Billy Powell, a roadie, would join on on keyboards. In 72, Al Cooper of Blood, Sweat, and Tears would sign him to his Sounds of the South label, partnered with MCA, and they'd release their first album. And at this time, they'd actually add Ed King, a guitarist and who also played some bass for him from a band called Strawberry Alarm Clock, which is what gave him that third guitarist sound. Their self-titled album would be released in 73 and would sell a million records and it would feature songs like Free Bird and Simple Man. 74 Set Helping featured Sweet Home Alabama, their biggest hit and a response to Neil Young's Southern Man. So it's actually, Sweet Home Alabama is actually the only song to crack the top 10 despite each of those albums selling over a million. So in 1975 and 76, several of the band members would leave and they would also add backup singers, the Honkettes, and release albums Nothing Fancy and Give Me Back My Bullets. Late in 76, during the re- recording of those two albums, they would replace the members that left, a new member named Steve Gaines, who they would feature a lot more on vocals and actually on guitar. Steve Gaines would actually be featured quite heavily in their 77 album, uh, Street Survivors. And during the process of adding Steve Gaines, when they were recording the 77 album, they also released a live album called One More for the Road. It would actually kind of take a long time to record because both Collins and Rossington had been in serious car accidents over a Labor Day weekend. In fact, Rossington's accident is what inspired the song, That Smell, because Van Sant was kind of making a hit out of him for kind of drinking and doing too much drugs, and that's why he got in the wreck. Uh, They were getting ready to headline New York's Madison Square Garden, which would fulfill a lifelong dream of Van Zant's. So they leave this Greenville, South Carolina performance on October 20th, 1977. So they're going to do the Madison Square Garden show in November. They leave South Carolina, and they board a flight to Baton Rouge to play at LSU. Due to a faulty engine, the plane ran low on field and was diverted toward Macomb Pike County Airport. And then it actually ran out of fuel and they crash landed in a heavily forested area five miles north of Gillsbury, Mississippi. Ronnie Van Zant, the up and coming Steve Gaines, his older sister Ed, and his older sister and backup singer Cassie Gaines, road manager Dean Kilpatrick, And both pilots, Walter McCreary and William Gray, all died on impact. The rest of the band and passengers all suffered serious injuries, but would eventually heal. That's what's the most crazy part about this airplane crash, is that there were people that survived. That it didn't didn't take everyone... Which, anytime you hear airplane crash, you immediately think all people on board dead. But it's not always... it's, It's actually more people survive them more often than you think yeah it, but yeah it's totally weird how like this whole group like it was like this whole group at the front of the plane died and everyone at the back of the plane was able to survive the plane crash happened three days after they released the the album street survivors the album actually shot to number five and went platinum but the uh Record company actually had to pull the original album cover because it showed Steve Gaines engulfed in flames. Oh, wow. <laughs> and yeah, so they didn't yeah. see that coming. 
obviously because they had been just no. released. So apparently 30 years later, they released it um, again because apparently enough time had gone by. But yeah, like they couldn't predict that he was actually going to die. The band went on hiatus from 77 to 87, except for a handful of tribute shows. In 1987, Leonard Skinner would reunite with five of the former band net members and would be fronted by Ronnie Van Zandt's little brother, Johnny Van Zandt. Collins would participate as a musical director and as part of his plea deal would be wheeled out on stage every night to explain to the audience why he could no longer perform, usually before the song That Smell. Wow. Wow. They actually yeah. like, almost like he doesn't have a choice. Like, we're just going to wheel you out there. <laughs> and once again, to the song That Smell. Collins would die in 1990 due to the complications of pneumonia, leaving Rossington as the only surviving band member. They would continue the tour as a tribute band, but would but uh, actually uh, would immediately be sued by the widows of Van Zant and Steve Gaines due to an agreement they made after the crash to not profit from the Leonard Skinner name. Mm. So now the widows get 30% of their touring revenue and they had a rule that forced any band touring under that name to feature at least three of the pre-crash members. Although as time has passed, that rule has relaxed. Well, I know there's a lot in there because there's so many huge name bands that were with the, they had songs that were in this episode. So it's actually surprisingly deep, like the, the, the musicians that were used in this episode. So we run in a little bit long. So let's get over and go talk about our final thoughts to this episode. All right, guys, this episode, and I'll kick off this fi final thoughts here. It was full of the A team. They brought in all their, their best horses. Their fastest horses came into this into this episode. They came guns blazing. And you know, when I first finished the episode, I was like, this is kind of boring. There's not much happened. We, I, was, I remember watching it. We we're like 35 minutes in. I'm like, not much has happened. But now that we've gone through this review, I actually have a different opinion about this episode. I actually kind of like it more than I did when we finished watching the episode. There's a lot of subtlety in here. A lot of callbacks to the original Smuggler's Blues. There's real police work happening I, I underestimated how much real police work crockett and tubs were doing in this and now that we've gone back through it i realized like well yeah they had to do that and they had to do this and if they wanted to bring it down like it was real police work so i i've kind of switched gears on this episode and think you know what? actually this was okay this was a good episode at first i was like man but it was kind of boring but now that we've gone through it's like it's actually really good i actually really like this episode and that's those sly kind of remarks and the deep cuts and the Miami Vice trivia that's kind of buried inside of it. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Um, I don't hate it. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's for me, it's one of those episodes where I didn't even remember what it was really about until we started watching. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> it just doesn't stick with me. It just doesn't to be fair, I didn't really like Smuggler's Blues that much. I mean Glenn Fry was great in it. I thought he was good. It just didn't really resonate with me. It didn't really stick with me, the storyline. So I think you're right. They did a ton of police work in it. And obviously, there's a lot of great music in it. So that keeps you interested. And that there's an actual twist that you don't see coming. She's like a double agent. She's sneaky. <laughs> you, know, you can't trust her. She acts like a bimbo, but she really is smart. I mean, it's nice to have like really good um, guest stars. And they have a lot of good guest stars this, this time. So it does break it up. But it still ultimately is about some rich kids. And actually, I didn't really remember that it was that there was that um, like social commentary of these rich people not mm. wanting minorities in their country. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's what he was going after because they're oh well, they're just stupid minorities. Basically, we don't need them here, and they don't do anything here. So I didn't realize that was in there. I will say it was a new thing that I didn't remember from previously watching the episodes mm -hmm. that there was social commentary about that part. And obviously, in Miami, that's a problem, mm -hmm. being that there's so many people that are from other countries living there. So that's, yeah, that's, yeah, a real that's what problem. I'm saying is on the on the deeper dive. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, there's more here than I originally saw. Yeah, there's more. Yeah, there's definitely more depth to it. Mm -hmm. It's not just like a fun, catchy episode, which yep. is what kind of what Smuggler's Blues was mm -hmm. because it had Glenn Fry. But yeah, overall, it's not a bad episode. It's not a, you know, I'm dying to get to the. I, I will admit, I am dying to get to the finale and us watching the first five minutes on accident of the finale. I'm like, oh, I could be watching that right now. So that might have swayed my opinion. But well, John, what are your final thoughts? I'm gonna be honest with you. I kind of, I kind of liked the episodes. Uh, I mean, even before we started the podcast, I was kind of staying quiet about it. But 
I I like the episode. I enjoyed everything except I wasn't too hot on the rich kid trust fund angle of it. But I mean, the episode aside, it it had humor. It had police work. I enjoyed it. I probably liked it as much, if not more, than the Smuggler's Blues mm-hmm. episode. So I think they did a good one, and I feel like a like it's a good one. Going into the, the the season two finale, if it left a bad taste in my mouth, it would have made it so I go in there in this, the finale like, uh, like all pissed off, you know. And <laughs> I actually, I enjoyed this episode. So it, it, the music was a little much to cover, but it was fantastic music yes. that they included. I, I think this one's a winner. This one's one of uh, one of the better ones. Yeah, you know, and this is the first time in quite a while where we've all been in an agreement that we all liked the episode exactly and i'm gonna say it right now if you guys don't like the finale (laughs) you got problems (laughs) well that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode we hope you enjoyed this breakdown be sure to check out the website go with the heat.com we'd love to hear from you please email us let us know what you think about this episode of miami vice too we would love to hear from you about what your thoughts are on on how this season ends email us go with the heat at gmail.com you know you get this show on youtube stitcher itunes google play tune in pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts you can get your hands on this on this episode or on our show so we hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see y'all next time bye pal